Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. My name is Luis. I'm a third year medical student from the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health. And welcome to Med School Deep Dive, where I interview different medical students from different med schools around the Philippines about their experiences of being a student in their respective med school. But before we start this video, please make sure to leave a like and subscribe as it really does support the channel. And with that out of the way, let's start the video. So hey guys, now I'm joined by uh, Grace Nariza of uh, the YouTube channel of the same name. So Grace, can you introduce yourself to the audience? Okay, hi guys, my name is Grace Nariza. I'm a second year med student in Cebu Institute of Medicine. Uh, my undergrad program was BS Pharmacy from Southwestern University. Mm. Okay, so Grace, to start things off, uh, why did you decide to pursue your medical education at CIM? Uh, well, I actually talked about this a few times in my channel, but specifically, it's based, uh, long story short, it's based on four factors. First was quality of education. I wanted to consider the uh, quality of the school I, want to, I wanted to get into, primarily because in the Philippines, we have 56, 56 higher education institutions, and I didn't want to just, you know, get a degree in it. I wanted to finish it. While at the same time, I have this ease that, okay, I got it from a quality uh, medical school. And then next was financial stability. Like, how am I going to afford this? Those type of factors like scholarship and if they are available in the, in the school and the environment. I personally have uh, the chance to practice or stay in the Cebu or maybe in the NCR. However, I like the balance of having just a few hour drive and then you get to see the beach or just a few hour drive, you get to see the mountains. So yeah, I prefer having that balance. It helps me, you know, be a well-rounded, that term, it does not even exist. Yeah. In med school. <laughs> yeah, I prefer to see that in my, you know, weekly life. Mm. Did you ever uh, consider... Uh like taking med school in Manila because so, like I, I have a fair share of classmates who like did come from the province and, and like decided to go here like to Manila to, for, to pursue their med school. I did actually. I, I really considered it but then because of financial uh, aspects it was just more practical because we have a house here or although I could stay in a place in Manila it just felt so uh, redundant if I would spend another separate spending because my brother is now here based in the Philippines aside from myself alone so I have to consider the factor that na, na I have my brother here. Okay so I guess it, like having family around is a big factor because it's you know it's, it's hard to live alone especially um, you know with med school. Okay so like, how is the experience of studying in CIM? Because, like, to my understanding, like, you guys are wanna uh, have a very unique uh, curriculum. Like, you use the uh, PBL. Yeah, we have problem-based learning. So, uh, in my year in CIM, that was probably one of the biggest changes because our whole life we're so used to traditional learning where the teacher discuss, the teachers discuss, and then we do the learning, and then we get tested for it. So it was a new, it was a new environment. However, the people are really pleasant. So it's like a colony of ants working together. So I talked about it a lot. It's actually the, it, it was actually the inspiration of one of my videos because a lot of the people I met in CIM during my first year was actually uh, smart people. I know they're capable of passing. I know they have the intellectual capability for it. However, because of the, serious adjustment they had to take within let's say the first two weeks the first two weeks you're not bombarded with exams yet but after that you get the real deal of being tested on materials that are so vast in the scope of it so yeah you it's it's a pro if you understand how pbl works if you want to pursue cim because we study it not by subject we study it by organ or system during the first year so let's say uh, first year subjects are mostly anatomy, physiology, histology, biochemistry, and your anatomy. But let's say we're studying the heart right now. Uh, we get tested regarding all those subjects regarding the heart. So we're not like organ or system or organ or system oriented. Is that what you call it in other schools? 
Um, in my school, we call it module, like we call it our module-based system, and I think UPCM calls it uh, organ system integrated. Yeah, organ system integrated. Yeah, someone asked me about that. If we are OSI, in a way, we are OSI. However, we receive this cases before a module or a topic begins, and then in the cases is different um, modules that you have to cover in order to understand, let's say, the heart or any organ as a whole. Yeah, I think like the unique difference between most like schools that also use the module-based system, like my, like, uh, my school, like in ASMPH and in UPCM, is that I think with the PBL module-based system is that you guys approach it from clinical before going into the theoretical, as opposed to us, like we, we approach it first from the theoretical and then move towards the clinical as we uh, move to the higher years. Ah, oh, really? Yeah, so I think that's my understanding. Because like, we don't have the, we don't, like, we're just, like, explain the theoretical immediately now. But it's still... Um, like yung, the cases... I like interview ko na, eh, no? When do you get the cases? <laughs> it's like yung, yung cases, um, like, the critical, the critical aspect is introduced like slowly in first year, parang yung for OSCE, and like how to perform physical exam and history. And, I, and it becomes more, the cases get introduced more thoroughly in second year, because that's when they introduce the pathologies. And then like now in third year, it's even more clinical now, because it's our last classroom year before we enter clerkship. So I think that's like a, the difference between how my school approaches the module based system versus how your school approaches the module based system. Yeah, it's it's get you get given the cases at the very beginning. Pero in first year, the cases we don't diagnose it. Pero right now in second year, after our orientation, we were told na yeah, you're gonna be diagnosing pertinent positive, pertinent negative, things that we didn't do in first year, like we order what labs are we gonna order for this specific patient. So things like that. So Right now, I'm currently still adjusting, and our SGD haven't begun yet. So, yeah, it's like interesting. Like once you're in second year, where like you you're given a vignette, and then you have to explain to your preceptor, you like, I know, like based on the symptoms, what will you rule in, what will you rule yeah. out, and then like you you just can't like throw everything to the wall, the right? You have to be specific, and you have to give logical reasons on why. Um, you'd rule in certain uh, diagnosis and you, why you'd rule out some diagnosis. Because, like, you know, if, in, because in theory, everything is possible. Where, you know, you only have so much time in the world and you have to be, like, uh, you have to be, like, uh, resourceful. Like, you have to be concise with uh, the, what you'll narrow down your list to. So how would you say, like, the teaching philosophy is of the school? Because, like, to my understanding, with uh, PBL, there's a lot of self-directed learning. You hear a lot of self-directed learning during the first year orientation. It's like the highlight of your orientation. You're going to be a self-directed learner again and again and again. And it, I didn't appreciate that actually until, you know, I get to meet, uh, we'll get to it later, but I joined an organization and I get to meet a lot of our alumni. alumni and then I heard from them that, you know, those self-directed learning is a big learning curve during your first years in med school, especially if you transition from first year, and then when you get to second year, it becomes so much more clinical. However, when you get after the years in school where you're, you're practicing, being a self-directed learner will actually pay a lot because you don't have a teacher to push you. You just have yourself, you know, the discipline to finish the readings from the book and not just based on notes. And yeah, that's one of the things we were push to do, like be a self-directed learner. Even if you find a note, uh, an older note from higher batches summarizing a certain chapter. A lot of my friends or batchmates still prefers reading the book because of how we were uh, read or oriented that you have to read the book. So, yeah, it takes up a lot of your time. Well, I think, like, since the month they don't emphasize a lot on lectures, I guess, like, you have a lot of time to do read the book. And I think that yeah. and I think that helps the month like helps especially come boards when you're you know basically board board prep season is in like th more than three months of you know self directed learning and I think it shows them on how and how CIM has consistently performed well in the boards year in and year out. So Marang, how's like the exam schedule in CIM? Are you guys like how often are you guys given major exams? 
Okay, so we have weekly major exams. Usually, it's just 50 items. And on, if you're first year, you have 100 items unit exams. But in second yeah. year, it's usually just 50 items until you reach your bi-monthly. Uh, for some reason, it's scheduled on Mondays because of the bulk of the reading list. So you have the weekend to, you know, catch up on your backlogs and things like that. So, yeah, exam are scheduled on Monday. You can be given a pre and post quiz during uh, lectures or labs. They are recorded. Some doctors actually do it. Some don't. Yeah, so we have practicals as well. And by monthly have this, how do you call it in your school? OSPE? OSPE. So, yeah. so, in, in clinical? In OSPE? Yeah, it's more of clinical or back in first year since we weren't that clinical, we were like, for example, for the station, you get shown an x-ray. You would say, is it abnormal or is it normal? Uh, what do you see abnormal, abnormal about it? Like that. Mm. Or maybe you know, there's headphones waiting for you on a station and then the, you would say, what type of heart murmur is this or what type of breathing sounds are this? Okay. I was like, it's quite interesting. Like you, you're already trained to listen, uh, to pay attention to ab abnormalities in first year. It's like second year now. I think now we just started learning about the the specific heart murmur sounds in second year. Eh? Like, like we were like introduced to it in first year, but to actually pay attention and like learn how to identify it. I think we only learned that in second year. Oh yeah. So maybe that's their purpose for us. Eh? Like we have to know the practical. I heard from a friend, but not in TIM, that they do it. Sad. But for a physical diagnosis, so I think it's more relevant because right now, for second year is more physical examination by region, things like mm. that. Okay. So, like, so I assume, like, based on what you've said, is that you, like, clinical, ex like, you, you have some clinical experience in first year, right? Parang you're, you're taught how to do history, but that's... Uh, not in depth. Oh. Uh, not in depth. Or like, even basic, uh, like, doctor-patient etiquette. And then, like, I guess that's ramped up now in second year when you're, you have patient encounters. Yeah, and we have this, like, uh, I think in other, call, uh, it's called, I forgot the term for it, right? Huh? For us, it's POM, but I think for others, it's like a return demo where you yeah, return ask, demo. like, your, your group mate or maybe the doctor is your patient and like that. We did that in first year, like, physical examinations of the skin or, uh, inserting ECG lead, we had that type of experience. Because there's this problem-based learning where you do your SGD, and we were also, uh, from time to time, we were given exercises with team-based learning where we got to experience that, like, insert. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we got to try inserting the proper positioning of your ECG leads and our classmate, and then, you know, uh, plotting the ECG of our friends, like, things like that. Mm. But since we're all normal... <laughs> It's more on basic, like we just, we barely touched it, it's just the surface. Yes, I think like com in comparison, like in my school, first year, heavy emphasis on like history, history taking skills. Because I like, that's something they want us to build through the three years. Eh? And then like, mm -hmm. they, we kind of dabbled in uh, some physical exam, Alalapa, for um, the cardio uh, and GI and neuro, because those are, I think, there's a lot of steps in that, so they they finally gave us a, uh, they they taught us some of those skills early on, and then like that carried over into second year where they taught us even more, uh, physical exam skills. It's just, and then it's interesting because I like you know like different schools have um, different philosophies and like when they start teaching their students phys uh, clinical skills. Like I think like my school and UPCM we st we're, we're one of the schools that like really put heavy emphasis starting first year, but I think most schools start usually around second year. Yeah, for physical diagnosis, that's actually the first two weeks or three weeks of our, right now, that's what I'm studying right now, physical diagnosis mm -hmm. by region. Uh, so with like, obviously like with the ongoing pandemic and how has the shift been? Like what are the chances you've, exp what are the chances you've faced in the shift from like, you know, face-to-face -face classes to online learning and what have you done to overcome these challenges? Oh, it's difficult to say because 
some days you get so motivated to you know study and there's not much of a change except for not seeing the school actually because our lectures are just 30 minutes to one hour and then we had to SGD or if not SGD we go home to study so <laughs> the routine itself the studying itself is not that much different but we do have changes in terms of examination so right now we're using Salview in monitoring our eye movements our body movements or we also have this environmental environment uh, check before the exam where you show your room so that they have a record of how um how prone you are or where there are chances of you cheating during the exam if you have low score in tell you if you know, it's not that credible for you not to cheat or things like that. Mm -hmm. So the adjustment, I think, is more on self-discipline since we can't go out, you know, just to change the environment in studying. It's more on finding ways how to connect with people without actually seeing people. So one good thing my friends initiated was doing Google Meet where we study together or Forest, those apps, those types of mm -hmm. apps. So yeah, I can't say for sure. Aside from the fact that I'm pretty bummed now, our clinic were supposed to be starting around September or November, but suppose, but right now, realistically speaking, we were told that they don't see face-to-face -face interaction until next year, so uh, until early next year. So. Mm. Yeah, so I think um, I I imagine that like the whole shift to online classes like wasn't so hard given your curriculum was mostly self-directed learning to begin with. So I guess like, you know, it's like the hard part is just really the inability to go out and see your friends and have social interaction. And I think like, you know, that that's that holds true for, you know, a lot of us med students because, you know, a lot of us, it, it's like most of us like tend to go out to study. And yeah, it's, like, you need it's, the change. Right? You need yeah. the change of position, change of environment. It gets too much if you just study in a single desk every time. Yeah, and it's and it's also hard like not having your friends to provide that emotional support. You know, it's like so. I think like sometimes when it gets really tough, you know, sometimes it uh you just need a hug from your classmates. <laughs> I can't even remember the last time I hugged a friend. <laughs> and the the grades usually get posted. You know, the feeling the feeling that you get the grades posted on the walls, and then you go to the walls. You know, you you see it with your friends. Those those feelings are not. Those feelings are just now emails, so I don't appreciate yeah. that part. Yeah, and there's like there's also like since we're mostly stuck at home, there's the there's the like the temptation, you know, when you wake up and it's like and since like we wake up and study in the same room for I think most of us, it's like it's it's so tempting to just go back to sleep. Or like, oh, I'll study on my bed because it's more comfortable. That was the next thing you know, you fell asleep now. And it's but for you, and, in your case, you have your family, so yeah, there's and, a and, sense of ease. Like there's no pressure to study. I'm still with my family. And and it's like and it's also hard at home because if you're with if you're living with your family, like they have other things, they have things going around the month. So like if you if you don't have a lot of like empty space in your house where you can like find a place to study, and you have if you have to share space, my ingay and it's hard to concentrate. Lalapag like it's actually one of the challenge of my batchmates actually. Okay. We have to take the exams and uh, ideally you don't have any other person in the room just to, you know, minimize or lessen the chance of you cheating. So for those people sharing the same room, it's a bit of a challenge that they have to compromise with each other because in the environment check, they have to see that there's no people, there's no writing, there's no books near you. So things like that. And then also, pa, like if you have, if someone else is like, if, if your parents are working, tapos yung, their job requires them to conference call. It's gonna suck up the internet. If you get disconnected from the internet, it's gonna ruin your exam performance because, uh, you know, whatever glitches may occur. So yeah, like, we only have an R. We still only have an R. There's no extension for it. So. Okay, so um, having, like, studied now in, like, med school for over a year, like, uh, do you have, like, any advice for uh, income, uh, like, aspiring medical students looking to apply to your school? Or uh, and like general advice in and and any general advice to medical students. Okay, so for getting into CIM, I think you really want to have to want to get into CIM because I I don't know for me personally I think the interview plays a big part because they they have uh, from experience 
CIM has this reputation that, oh, I can't get into CIM, I'm not a straight A student from before, or it's just for smart people. It does have this reputation, but technically I have met people like me, like kind of average people or people who just, you know, just have the passion for medicine. And it really showed during their interview. So during interview, just be genuine about wanting to get into the school or about wanting to become a good doctor. Just be prepared. It will really show like being prepared plays a big part of getting into your dream med school. And once you get in there, I there is I realize there's no perfect formula tip for anything or whatsoever. It's just that you have to stay on your lane. Because no matter how smart you were back in undergrad, you might be a cum laude or a board of not sure. It won't matter. Or you might have 99 percent talent and not, but it won't matter actually. When you get there, there will be a lot of times where you feel stupid, dumb, inadequate, or you know, just like the underdog. But just stay in your lane avoid comparing yourself and if you do compare yourself just say okay so what if he's good at this or so what if i'm not good at this so yeah i, I talked about growth mindset a lot and if you really need to establish that before you enter any med school not just the am just establish your growth mindset and i think you'd be stable for most part of it yeah i'd have to agree with that because like i'm a, also a huge proponent of like the idea of growth mindset like you know like it doesn't matter like if you know you have batchmates so like oh okay, for one read lang gets na nila. Mm-hmm. Like what well, like you can't control that there. Eh? What you can control is your own effort. And like I think what matters is as long as you improve every day, if you're you're already you're already doing your absolute and you're doing and if you're doing your absolute best, I think you're already like doing really well in med school as long as you know you're trying your absolute best and you're um or you're, you're constantly striving to get better each and every single day. Mm, yeah, Kuya Luis, there's no absolute best na 100% every day. Parang today, 30% lang ako. <laughs> Tomorrow, yeah, well, baka 70% na ako, ganun. Yeah, well, like, you know, everyone's best is different. But I think, like, you know, it's just what matters is that you, you strive to do the best of your ability, no matter, like, no matter, uh, no matter the situation. Outside of like the, the the student life, like how's the life outside the classroom in terms of like in org culture in CIM? Yeah, so they do focus academically, but organizations uh, exist in CIM. We have aside from the student body or the SSC, we also have uh, student led organizations like the one I'm in, Total Outreach for Community Health, and then we also have. Uh, Alpha Mu Sigma Phi. Um, for, we also have, re- I think they are a religious organization. Mm-hmm. We also have the choir. There's also a school paper. Uh, there also, there's also AMSA, another organization for uh, similar to ours. Mm-hmm. So there's a life outside CIM with people inside CIM. Mm-hmm. The type of thinking. Yeah, yeah I think like uh, there's this uh, stereotype, you know, like if you're a med student, all you do is, stu- is study. But I think, lalapa when it comes to like extracurriculars and especially kapag sports, does does the CIA participate in med Olympics? Yeah, but yeah. I'm not sure because I was supposed to play at this med Olympics, but it got cancelled due to COVID. Uh, so I'm I not think sure like, what sports we excel at. <laughs> okay. So like um like having talked to med students from other schools is like I think like the true like we're more than a med student uh mindset comes out kapag sports because like it's, I I don't know with the Visayas medical schools but like with with the Luzon medical schools we're like super competitive when it comes to palerong medicina because like you know we like we have a especially like in my school and I think in a UERM we have a fair share of former. UAAP athlete. So when once it comes down to competing, we're like super competitive, and I think that that just shows them that you know we're just not we're just not nerds who study all day. Like we're we're people with other talents and like you know other skills, and I think that makes we us. Play. Yeah, <laughs> and I think that like makes us develop like more having stuff outside of just studying like makes us more. Well, I think will make us more relatable to our patients in the long run. Okay, so um, having been a student now in CIA for like more than a year, like. In your time, like when, when uh, during, before the pandemic hit, what is like one thing about the school that you really like? Hmm. Oh yeah, we have this mentoring mm-hmm. where you, your first facilitator, that's what we call the physician in the 
SGD this uh, small group discussion with us. Uh, we have this mentoring wherein wherever whenever you have troubles or confusion or you just want someone to talk to, you could go to that certain doctor and that could doc that doctor would mentor you. So mm -hmm. that's pretty consistent, and I could say that it did come helpful for a lot of my friends because mm -hmm. you have someone you could you know look up to well at the same time ask words of wisdom yeah i think that's like it's important to have like someone who can like a like a an older figure or like a like a like someone that you can look up to for advice especially like you know like not all of us someone come from a family of doctors so lalapa if you're a first generation doctor it's nice to have someone who's like experienced who can mentor you in the field yeah, because you can try with your friends, but the wisdom that comes from someone who's been through the process and have done it all, it's different and it feels more calming. I mean, no offense to my friends, but it really does. <laughs> it just feels calming if it's from a doctor, per se. Yeah. So, like, as a follow-up to that, like, uh, what's one thing that you wish um, CIM could, uh, would add or improve on within your remaining stay as a student of the school? Hmm. I can say um, it's not something that plays a big part in terms of their quality of education. It's just something that I would appreciate mm -hmm. if I'm someone who has no idea about CIM. Because if you've searched about it from the internet, you don't see a lot of things regarding CIM. You know, the, it's not a modern school where you could see a lot of ads about it on Facebook or any any platform on the internet. So I would prefer or I would appreciate it if the school would become more active. But I don't think that plays a big part with how they teach or how they train us. So it's a pretty minor thing. I think that's true with uh, regards to like a lot of the provincial schools that they, I don't think they get a, a lot of uh, promotion at least within the NCR region because you know like um, there's a lot of like most of the, the word of mouth is about like the big four schools eh? so you know like you, you usually the my household names are like your UP College of Medicine, UST, Ateneo and then also like UERM because that's one of the bigger medical schools in Manila and I think like the provincial schools mainly get their promotion to people from outside the region their respective regions through their performance in PLE, because that's how I first learned about CIM. As like when I found like there was the the board top notcher from CIM who who made it, who was on the who made it to news outlets because he was I think just playing video games. Um, yeah. The week leading up to the physician licensure exam, I was like, oh, it's like they're and I was like surprised. Oh, they're 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 really really good medical schools, pala outside of Metro Manila, and I think you know that the I think med medical schools in uh, in provinces should promote themselves more because uh, it's it makes it it makes the education more accessible to people in the provinces because you know not everyone can afford to go to Metro Manila and like the schools here in Metro Manila are more expensive so I think like given the shortage of medical prof of doctors especially here in the Philippines I think it would be better that if you know like people if if education were made more accessible in the provinces so like before we close this interview grace is like is there anything that you'd like to promote like your social media or any like business uh, obviously other than your youtube channel or any message you'd like to give to the audience um aside from just staying home unless you need to go out yeah i do youtube on my vacant time my handle is grace Marisa. You can go follow me under that name on Instagram. I'm much more active there if you can find me on YouTube. And yeah, I don't want to say a lot of things, so I'll just end it there. Okay, so guys, if you're interested in checking out uh, Grace Grace's channel or following her on Instagram, I'll leave links down below so that you can easily access them there. So mm -hmm. uh, Grace, I'd like to thank you so much for your taking the time to take part in this interview, and I wish you all the best in this coming school year. Thanks, Louise.